Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, at least on the East Coast of the United States as we go live. My name is Mark Shellhammer. I'm the MC for today's event. I direct the Human Space Flight Lab here at Johns Hopkins University at the School of Medicine and a program we call Bioastronautics at Hopkins that aims to promote human space flight, not only here, but at other universities and institutions as well. This is part of a larger umbrella group at Hopkins called Space at Hopkins. Our efforts are supported by the Office of Research and Translation in the School of Engineering. And today's event is run by our partners, Hopkins at Home, which provide the video and online promotion and productions for this event. This is the fourth one of our online events. The first one is in February of last year, a half day symposium. Since then, we've had two of these mini symposia on the topics of systems medicine for space flight and statistics for human space flight research. Today's topic is surgery in space. We'll have presentations from two experts in this field, comments from a current NASA scientist that are relevant to surgery in space, hopefully a good vigorous but courteous discussion among the three of them and then questions from the audience. You can submit written questions online during the presentation. They'll be read by my postdoc, Malika Sarma. I should also note that Linda McLean of the Office of Research and Translation has been a key player in organizing this activity. So our speakers today, I will introduce them now up front so we can get the, uh, the formalities out of the way. The first one will be George Pantelos. He's a professor uh, in the Department of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery at the University of Louisville. He's a PhD in physiology, a master's in biomedical engineering, and a BS in aeronautical and astronautical engineering, all from Ohio State University. He's a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. George has been a major proponent of space surgery for a long time, pretty much since I've known him. He's performed supporting experiments in several parabolic flights. That's the zero-G vomit comet aircraft. An automated version of his experiment flew on a Virgin Galactic suborbital flight last year. These experiments obviously don't involve actual surgery on humans, but are helping to refine some of the procedures that would be needed in order to successfully and safely perform surgery in space. And I'm sure you're gonna be hearing about those projects. The second speaker will be Danielle, Danny Carroll. She's a general surg surgery resident at Eastern Virginia Medical School, a bioastronautics researcher at the University of Colorado Boulder, past president of the Space Surgery Association. She has a BA in bioethics and Italian at the, from the University of Virginia, and also, of course, a medical degree. She was a United States Air Force pilot, achieving the rank of captain, and has flown high-performance aircraft, totaling over 1,000 hours of logged time. And finally, responding from partly from the NASA perspective, but not necessarily speaking for NASA, will be Chris Lanehart. Chris is the element scientist for the exploration medical capabilities element at NASA in the human research program. And that is the group that is responsible for figuring out what the medical needs and requirements will be for exploration class space flights, like going back to the moon and going on to Mars. He's a senior faculty member at the Baylor College of Medicine and the Center for Space Medicine and the Department of Emergency Medicine. He is an emergency physician, board certified in emergency medicine in Canada and the United States. He was previously an attending physician and assistant professor at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Now, let me introduce today's topic. One of the most questions, most frequent questions that I get when I give talks about space flight is about surgery in space. It seems like it's very popular. I get that question much more often than I get people asking about how you go to the bathroom in space. That seems like old, old news now. Uh, but surgery in space seems like, uh, like a popular idea. It would seem obvious that as flights become longer and more ambitious, medical issues will become more serious 
the ability to care for them will become more limited. You consider a three-year Mars mission. By the time you get to a certain point in that mission, you're not able to, to rely on mission control for help anymore. And certainly real-time help in terms of medical problems is out of the question. And if something should happen on those flights, you cannot do a medical evacuation. So when you start to think about the medical capabilities that would be required and ethically desirable on that kind of mission, surgery comes up. And yet it's not as simple as that, because if you're going to take the facilities and equipment that's, that are necessary to do surgery, there are other things that you can't take because you're using volume, mass, other things. Also, you have to consider how current, even if you were to have a physician on board, trained in surgery, how current would that surgical training be? So there are not only issues of feasibility of what you can accomplish in space flight in terms of surgery, but ethical questions and questions of what you should try to do. And should you, instead of trying to accommodate surgery, just recognize that pharmacological and other interventions might be more suitable. So hopefully we'll get into a discussion of all that broader range of topics. So let's start out uh, the uh, science portion today with our talk from George Pantelos. George, you're up. Hey, Mark, thanks for that generous introduction. Uh, and thanks for the invitation to join you. Also thanks to Hopkins at Home for being very gracious and expert host for us. Uh, I'm looking forward to having this wonderful discussion with colleagues who are also friends and seeing if we can't uh, collectively get a better understanding of what we're talking about and what we need to understand when we're saying providing surgical capabilities for exploration spaceflight. Uh, needless to say, this is something that you don't do on your own. And uh, the work I will present is based on work I first started at the University of Utah and, and have continued here at the University of Louisville and, and literally does include a constellation of collaborators from students to staff to faculty and, and beyond. So uh, it's, it's a very involved, but very interesting, exciting and fun process. Uh, I have no disclosures uh, before I give this presentation. Um, let's see, I don't see my slides advancing. If you could help me out here. There we go. This is a very exciting time in human spaceflight. Um, possibly within the next few weeks, we will finally see the Artemis One with the Orion spacecraft on top head to the moon. And, and lay the groundwork for what we hopefully will be a flight in a few years with a human crew. And this is paving the way for more ambitious missions to the moon, around the moon, other places, including Mars, that as Mark said, is gonna require much more uh, ambitious medical capabilities on the crew and less dependence on guidance from mission control. But let me create a little story, a little scenario here to, to introduce you to the concept of surgery in space. And it's, it's not that the surgical procedure is that much different, it's the context is different, the resources are different. Um, some of the limitations are different than when you do it on the earth. So uh, I'm gonna lay a lot of background, Danny will pick it up and elaborate on many of these details and talk about other topics as well. So imagine this clinical scenario, halfway to Mars. So this is, this is a case report that we put together. Um, an astronaut develops abdominal pain associated with nausea, vomiting, and fever. Um, possibly you've had these symptoms as well. Uh, lab results indicate a low-grade leukocytosis or, or an increase in white blood cells, and the probable diagnosis is appendicitis. Pain and tenderness are localized to the lower right quadrant. If, you, if you've ever had appendicitis, you're aware of that very peculiar pain down on your lower right side. Um, ultrasound imaging confirms an abnormal dilated structure in the lower right-hand quadrant, again, 
giving more confirmation to the anticipated diagnosis of appendicitis. Now, the astronaut is treated with antibiotics. We don't want to go right to surgery. Hopefully, antibiotics and intravenous fluid will result in the resolution of symptoms. And in this case scenario that we're considering, it results in partial resolution of symptoms. But within a week, the astronaut develops a high fever with increased lower right quadrant pain. Repeat ultrasonic imaging reveals there is an abscess around the appendix. So the, the appendix has now burst. And the crew medical officer prepares the abdomen for abscess drainage to, to clear that material so that it doesn't lead to further complications. Uh, the surgical assistant will prepare the instruments and aims the ultrasound probe. And then with ultrasonic guidance, the crew medical officer inserts a needle into the lower right quadrant under local anesthesia, not general anesthesia, but local anesthesia. And needle aspiration, meaning pulling back on the syringe uh, to see what comes out, reveals that it, it does pull back pus, uh, confirming that you're at the abscess. So a guide wire is slid through the needle to the abscess, and the needle is removed. And then using a scalpel, the crew medical officer makes a small incision along the wire and slides a drainage tube uh, to the location of the abscess. Um, the wire is withdrawn, suction is applied to the catheter draining the abscess, and this continues for several days. Um, antibiotics and suction are continued for about one week. Um, my slides have gone white. Oop, okay, there we go. Um, when the drainage subsides, the catheter is removed, and the small wound from the catheter heals with a daily change of dressing, which could be something as simple as a Band-Aid. And with no return of symptoms, the astronaut returns to duty. It sounds like a very straightforward scenario. But like everything else we do in, in this day and age, uh, we've got to do some fact checking. So the first thing is the crew medical officer is not a surgeon. But the crew medical officer has pre-flight and periodic in-flight training, including minimally invasive surgical technique. Now. There is a president, uh, 1942, pharmacist mate Wheeler B. Lips performs an appendectomy on a crew member on the USS Sea Dragon submarine. Uh, and you can see he, he observed previously surgical procedures when he worked as an assistant in OR on the land. Um, somehow or another, he had uh, enough materials that he was able to perform the appendectomy and the sailor survived and, and went on back to duty. Not the ideal conditions to do an appendectomy, but you can figure out a way when you need to. Um, and likewise, 1961, down at the Russian Antarctic Research Station, the Russian physician has symptoms of appendicitis that don't clear up and has to wind up doing an appendectomy on himself. Again, not the ideal situation, but it's a way to get it done. Now, the, the medical assistant is not a person, but it's a human-inspired dexterous robot. Here you can see Robonaut 2, a robot developed down at the NASA Johnson Space Center Robotics Lab, responding to a request from the surgeon to hand him a particular instrument He's given a verbal command, just like you would to your surgical assistant. Robonaut 2, here's the command, interpret it, goes to its pattern recognition with its visual system, identifies the instrument, grasps it, and then hands it off to the surgeon. Now, the CMO and assistant are using integrated augmented reality to see the anatomy. And in fact, virtual reality uh, and, in, and augmented reality are a couple of different techniques that we've begun to explore, as have others, as to how can you help identify the needed anatomics landmarks and guide the surgeon through the procedure. Now, a number 11 scalpel blade was manifested to do the incision, but the scalpel handle and the drainage catheter were both 3D printed just prior to the procedure. 
Here you see an example of 3D printed scalpel handle, forceps, and hemostats. So it, it can be done. And because of the heat of the 3D printing process, if you are careful when you remove them, they will stay sterile. The procedure was conducted on the dining room table of the crew quarters. It wasn't conducted in this amazing surgical suite that you see in this artist's conception of a space station probably 100 years or more from now. And if you uh, are familiar with the interior of the modules in the space station, you might see something like this. If you look closely, you can see that there is a table that can be folded out at least once or twice. It's often used for dining, it's used for other things, and there's no reason why it couldn't also be used temporarily as an operating room table to perform a surgical procedure. So in the next 30 years or less, will we be seeing surgery on the moon? Will we see surgery on Mars and other places in exploration spaceflight? I, I guess we'll just have to stay tuned and see what happens. And one of the things that's certain is that the steps that we're making now probably aren't the way it is going to happen once it finally happens, but it's the necessary developmental steps that you need to go through to figure out exactly what you need, how you need it, how you're going to do it, and how you're going to manage your resources, train your staff uh, to do what needs to be done to restore the crew member back to health. And that's, uh, that concludes my presentation at this stage, other than the uh, encouragement to always share your spaceflight adventures. Uh, someone could advance the slide, please. Uh, again and again in lots of different ways. And the next slide, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. And the final slide, thanks again for your attention and for the opportunity to visit with you today. Thank you, George. So let me let me uh, ask you a few questions or some discussions. So first, let me let me remind people that they can put questions into the uh, into the chat, and Malika will be uh, will be taking those questions. We're going to wait until the end after the two presentations and uh, Chris Lanehart's comments before we start taking audience questions, but I will take the prerogative right now of engaging with George for a couple of, a couple of points. So George, you mentioned uh, the use of augmented reality, virtual reality. Mm -hmm. You know, it all starts to, it all starts to sound very feasible when you, when you start bringing in modern technology like that and, and how it can be done. But in that specific example, mm -hmm. what kind of imaging capability would you need to have in place on the flight to be able to use uh, AR or VR in a realistic manner? One of the expectations is in each of the crew members' medical records that but exist both on the ground and uh, in the spacecraft, um, there will be a full body MRI scan that's taken prior to flight uh, in the uh, 1G supine posture. What that does is it gives you a pretty good idea where the anatomic landmarks of interest are gonna be located. Now, admittedly, they will change a little bit as the shape of the body does change when you go into weightlessness and as there are various adaptations to that, but it will at least get you uh, in, in the ballpark. And then from that, um, there are ways to create overlays that would be registered um, from the original MRI scan that are superimposed over the patient that would help guide you to the landmarks that you're interested in. That would be supplemented with ultrasonic imaging at the same time. And I know Danny will, will spend some time talking about that. So that's uh, what we're anticipating. Okay. Yeah. So it's the idea of kind of cross-correlating the pre-flight image, a real, a real high quality image with a lesser resol lower resolution image of ultrasound actually in mm -hmm. flight i like that idea because it kind of updates it yeah. uh, but your concern uh, if you i'm glad you mentioned it because i was going to mention it if you didn't the the idea that things are changing in space so not yes. only are they by the time they get back from a mars mission three years older 
for mm -hmm. a three year Mars mission, but you know, even on the way there, significant. But the adapt the process of adaptation to spaceflight, who knows what's going on with shifting body, or we know that from Rachel Seidler's work, among others, mm -hmm. that the brain shifts upward very slightly in the skull, doesn't have much room to move, but it does shift upward slightly. Mm -hmm. So you would want not want to rely on solely on pre-flight uh, pre images. That's right. The other, the other point I wanted to get at, and I, I think maybe this is what where Chris will direct some of his comments, maybe uh, uh, heads up to Chris. But you, the, the examples that you mentioned of surgery having taken place in uh, under less than ideal circumstances on, on a ship, uh, mm -hmm. 1942, um, self uh self-performed appendectomy 1961 but mm -hmm. it raises the question of what was what were the capabilities where did those people fit into the crew is what i'm getting now i don't want to be cavalier here and this is going to sound terrible when i say this mm -hmm. but at some point when do you say well i'm sorry that crew member has performed most of his or her tasks. And I'm sorry that we can't treat this. Mm -hmm. And if we did treat it, we'd be taking away a lot of resources and consumables that we might need to treat somebody else later on in this mission. When do we just let that person let the medical process run its course, which it could be a very unpleasant course, but when do you do, it's a broader question of with, kind of withholding medical care or just giving Palliative, palliative care, mm -hmm. but especially when you're talking about a surgical procedure that because of the, the issues that you've raised, George, mm -hmm. does carry some significant risks with it. When is it better to just say, we're not even going to address, we're not even going to get into this game mm -hmm. because of so many risks. We really don't need that crew member at full capability. Mm -hmm. So we'll just let it go and not address it with surgery. Does that does that enter into any of your considerations as you approach this? It, it does. And that's a very, could be a very, very long discussion, which I'm not the best uh, prepared to discuss. Certainly Danny and, and Chris are probably better prepared to discuss that than I am. But I will say going back, part of the pre-flight preparation for an exploration crew, and, and it's, it's even done to some extent with current crews, is the discussion of the medical ethics of what happens if you do get injured, if you get critically injured, what level of care is possible to deliver, and, and how do you determine that that's all you can do? Um, so it's, it's not like they're being confronted with that question at the very first time, and that there would, I'm, I'm sure there would be disappointments and frustrations, but uh, hopefully long before the mission has taken place, there has been consensus in the way that determination has been made uh, with the healthcare team for the project and with the mission planners so that it's it's incorporated as, as a part of the mission rules. So it's it's not, the first time you consider it isn't when you're confronted with the situation where you're raising the question of, of doing surgical treatment. It's long before that. Uh, yeah. But we all know that, that not all surgical procedures go the way they're intended and that there's only so many things you can do. Um, and, and that after a while, you do have to say that realistically, there is nothing else that can be done. But spaceflight adds a, an additional dimension to that because you not only have to consider what's the impact and the effect of the crew member, but what's the effect on the rest of the crew? What's the effect on overall crew um, mission success? What's the effect on overall mission survival? So you, you have to take that additional level that you normally don't have to do in a surgical procedure in an operating room in a hospital. Yeah, and you're also, effectively, depending on the intensity of the procedure and the complications, mm -hmm. potentially taking a second crew member out of, out of commission, off of his or her normal duties to mm -hmm. care for the, 
to care for the surgical patient. That's right, exactly. And that, that could be that's, prolonged. Yeah, and that, that's why in my presentation, we mentioned the possibility of using a human-inspired dexterous robot as an assistant. Um, it, is, it is reasonable to assume on an exploration mission that there will be a human-inspired dexterous robot more than likely to do housekeeping and other repetitive types of tasks. But we wanted to ask the question, is it possible to do more advanced programming so that their capabilities can be greater? And, and especially because as, as you've just said, that when you're doing this procedure, you're using a large number of the available crew members and someone has to tend to the ship or a couple of people still have to tend to the ship and there's gotta be the surgeon there is going to have to be someone who's managing anesthesiology, but that may also be the same person who's essentially the circulating nurse. Um, and then, then you have the assistant. So managing your crew resources is going to be very, very critical as well. Yeah, and, and I'm intrigued by the possibility, if not the, the likelihood, that this calculation changes during the course of the mission, right? Because it could be yep. very different in the first three months of a three-year mission as opposed to the last three months. You're on your way back home, you've already yep. landed, you've done the surface exploration. You can afford to, you would be, people might frankly welcome the opportunity to do meaningful work during the long journey home. I mean, mm -hmm. not that they would wish their crew members ill, no. but it would give them something to do to keep them in, engaged. Whereas on the way out or within a week of landing on Mars, mm -hmm. that calculation would be very different. Different, different. Uh, because Indeed, not only, yeah, not only that, you would be then having to accommodate somebody who has just had recent surgery during G transitions of a landing. Mm -hmm. take those into consideration but yeah i agree with your overall point that hopefully these will have been considered before anybody even gets on the spacecraft before they even design and build the spacecraft mm -hmm. so okay thank you george uh i'll You're turn welcome. it over over now to uh dr carol for her presentation danny All right. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and I really enjoyed, first of all, that conversation just now that you all had. Um, so I'm looking forward to piggybacking off of the wonderful start that George made to this uh, to this session. So again, my name is Dr. Danny Carroll. Uh, it's an absolute privilege to be here. So thank you so much to Dr. Shellhammer and the whole Hopkins at Home team for uh, for having me, letting me join. All right. I have no financial relationship to disclose uh, other than that I'm employed by Eastern Virginia Medical School and I also lead some research projects at CU Boulder. Uh, so just briefly, here's what we'll be talking about for the next several minutes. And I wanted to start by just um, mentioning a few of the places that have been a part of my path up to now. Uh, it's been, as Mark mentioned, a combination of military service and flying, uh, general surgery, aeronautical engineering, and bioastronautics, specifically uh, research in that arena, and then also in space medicine with a focus on innovation, which is really the sweet spot for me. Uh, so suffice it, suffice it to say, I'm pretty passionate about space health uh, and space health innovation, and certainly about finding really creative ways to support human health in very extreme environments to include deep space. Um, this is the work that gets me up in the morning um, and that I really love. So again, thanks for letting me speak here. So I wanted to just zoom out for a moment and define a few terms. Uh, some of these terms George and Mark threw around a few minutes ago, but you know, for folks who might not be familiar, uh, historically aerospace medicine was a branch and still is technically a branch of preventative medicine, which by default uh, extended to the subset of space health, which we're talking about today, of course. Um, so whereas classical medicine that most of us who are physicians learned about in school uh, has primarily involved the study of abnormal physiology in what's considered a normal terrestrial 1G environment, it was traditionally stressed that aerospace medicine dealt with the exact opposite, which was normal physiology like i.e. very healthy astronauts, but in an abnormal or non-standard environment. And so now as opportunities become more readily available for uh, all sorts of folks from all sorts of backgrounds to fly and to go into space, 
we're dealing more and more with abnormal physiology in the abnormal environment. And this is, again, especially true of the commercial spaceflight realm, uh, where you know, it's uh, unlike typical NASA or JAXA or ESA or, you know, other folks, other astronauts who are screened very rigorously before selection. Commercial crews tend to bring with them a litany of medical issues that we just haven't had to deal with yet in space. And so with this in mind, we've started asking if prevention is really enough. And spoiler alert, I think most of us who are involved in the space health uh, realm would say that, no, it's probably not. But then the question becomes, how best can we be prepared to treat these diseases that might arise in space in the same or similar diseases that we see on Earth? So with that, in a nutshell, we're looking at how to prevent illness um, and also treat disease and also, uh, which is unique to this setting, optimize crew health and performance for the spaceflight setting uh, to ensure mission effectiveness and mission success. And so listed here on this slide are 14 of the highest priority topics in space health at the moment. They're complex multifactorial, of course, and they're absolutely interrelated. And needless to say, the larger space medicine community is still working on figuring out how to keep astronauts not just alive, but also happy, healthy, and productive on longer and longer and longer duration missions to the moon and then ultimately to Mars. And so it's important to recognize that while as physicians we see this, as you see in this picture here, uh, when we think of human spaceflight, most engineers see this, uh, and this is part of why I chose to pursue uh, graduate coursework in engineering, to be able to see both sides of the coin. And so uh, with all the mass, power, and volume considerations that are involved in putting uh, together missions of this magnitude, it's really a tough sell to bring a robust medical suite's worth of supplies. And so instead, we have to be really judicious and very selective about how to approach medical care in the most austere setting that you can possibly imagine. So with that, we've, we've just established that medical and surgical events are going to happen on long duration missions. I think uh, George and Mark both certainly touched on that. Um, a lot can go wrong when you talk about having six or so adult bodies uh, over the course of a three year mission. And um, medical evacuation in this setting, of course, will not be an, an option. Um, and imaging capabilities are gonna be pretty limited uh, for management of in-flight emergencies and things. Communication delay, which uh, George and Mark talked about a little bit, we'll talk about a little bit more here shortly. Uh, that, the comm delay really complicates remote guidance, um, so that's uh, less feasible in this setting. And then there are also differences in clinical presentation and microgravity uh, or weightlessness, which we need to deal with too. So these are just some of the problems that we're trying to tackle here. And uh, this is a slide of uh, medical conditions that have actually happened in the history of human spaceflight. And I, I usually like to actually add this slide uh, to most presentations that I give, because I think it's important to dispel this notion early on that astronauts are somehow superhuman um, and immune to the things that afflict everyone, all human beings, you know, or most human beings. Uh, I know it's a bit of an eye chart for this setting, but overall, the majority of these conditions are things that are related to one of three big categories. One is physiologic adaptation to space. Um, one is related to the nuances of microgravity itself. And then uh, the third category, broadly speaking, is items that are similar to what you might encounter in an urgent care on Earth. So things like rashes, strains, sprains, et cetera. So with that, I wanted to pause for a moment and just discuss where we are right now and where we're going. Um, you've heard of the Artemis program, but I thought a quick graphic might help to give a sense of the complexity involved at literally every level of, uh, of planning a mission like this, not just on the medical front. Um, so this is the approximate plan for Artemis 1, which is the uncrewed mission that was supposed to have launched last month, but underwent some serial delays uh, due to a few different factors. And NASA's current plan, as you might be aware, is to put the first woman and person of color on the moon in the next several years, which will mark a return of humans to the lunar surface for the first time since the 1960s. So it's incredibly exciting. Um, and after that, we'll be traveling all the way to Mars. And the timing, of course, is to be determined, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic uh, that it's going to happen in the next decade or so. Um, so... And for the purposes of developing technological and technical capabilities, we need to make sure that we're thinking ahead. And that's really what this presentation is about. So developing and refining new products and new processes and really vetting them before deploying them takes time and resources. And even though Mars missions seem to be a ways off, time has a way of going very quickly. So we really need to be ready and forward thinking about this stuff. 
So right now, since the ISS or the International Space Station is located in low Earth orbit, we get to enjoy the myriad benefits of it being in Earth's magnetosphere. It's protected from lots of the hazards that uh, are intrinsic to the spaceflight setting, and we can actually get somebody off the ISS and back down to Earth in about nine hours uh, if there's an, an emergency that happens right now, which is a pretty quick trip, all things considered. And missions to Mars, of course, as I mentioned previously, are going to require a, a total shift in paradigm, a shift in mentality, moving from an augmented and very well-supported and resource-rich environment to one that's going to require entirely autonomous operations for really long stretches of time. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on preparing for missions to Mars. And no part of this journey is simple. Um, of course, we know that planetary orientation is dynamic, and the Earth is not only rotating on its own axis, but it's also orbiting the sun, and Mars is doing the same thing. So it makes it a pretty complicated math problem to figure out uh, when to leave and what the flight path needs to look like and uh, you know, to make the trip as short as possible, because then that means that fewer resources will be consumed in, the, in transit or in the interim. Um, and unless we're able to harness a different type of energy, <laughs> and I'll leave that to your imagination, uh, to speed up the trip, we're looking at about 18 months round trip, not including time spent on the Martian surface. And for, you know, for this reason, the first crewed missions to Mars will probably be on the order of about two and a half or three years in duration. All right, so what's our starting point from a medical preparedness perspective? Um, and what medical capabilities do we already have? Well, over the last 60 or so years of human spaceflight, as the duration and complexity of each mission has increased, the in-flight medical capabilities have too. And so we started with, in the Mercury era, a simple pack with antiemetics and decongestants, and that was in the 50s and 60s, early 60s. Um, and then in Gemini, a slightly heftier med kit, and then the somewhat intrusive in-flight monitoring capabilities that were famously included in the Apollo missions. You can remember I think it was Tom Hanks tearing off the EKG leads in Apollo 13. Um, and then in the shuttle era, it was compartmentalized kits. And then uh, we went into, on the ISS or in ISS era, a shift from the medical kit to the medical system. And that's what we've been seeing in the last decade or so, or last two decades rather, with the ISS. And so you might notice that here, something is missing. <laughs> Um, and yes, I'm a little bit biased as somebody in surgery, but surgical disease up to now just hasn't really been a part of the planning process. And so this is why the Space Surgery Association that Mark mentioned exists, and it's to change that very thing. So let's talk a little bit about risk. Um, this image is from the Bioastronautics Group at CU Boulder, uh, where I did my engineering training. Um, and the image on the left is from a person-centric view, and on the right is from a vehicle-centric view. But here we're looking at human risk in spaceflight relative to other types of risky behavior. Um, and I know this is a little bit of an eye chart too, um, but I just wanted to kind of orient you. So where, you know, shuttle era or shuttle missions were just above uh, the level of risk that was purported to be involved in climbing Denali or climbing Everest. Um, so just to kind of frame that in your mind. And you can see, you know, way down at the bottom is something like driving a car or flying in a, in a commercial airliner, for example. So yes, we know that this is that there's risk involved, uh, but I just wanted to outline that before we jump into medical risk. And uh, so how, how does the greater space medicine community buy down medical risk? Um, well, the way that we do that, broadly speaking, um, and I'm not just talking about NASA, but about all folks that are involved in this, this whole process, um, is that we plan for it. And uh, NASA, NASA's integrated medical model, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like, um, outlines the 100 medical conditions that are most likely to develop in flight. And a revised version that's actually tailored to the exploration class setting is in the process of being finalized right now. But I did have a chance to glance at it um, in the last several days. And the core conditions really aren't changing that much from what you see here. Um, so keep in mind, these 100 or so conditions are really just a tiny sliver of the overall bigger picture of medical conditions that could potentially develop. Um, and we know this as physicians you know, who spend four years in med school plus a handful in residency learning to treat all sorts of different conditions, um, not just 100 of them. And so given the specific nuances of the spaceflight setting, you know, these are, these are the ones, though, these are the conditions that are collectively believed to be the most likely to arise. Regardless of all of that, looking closely at these 100 conditions here, over a quarter of them may need procedural or surgical intervention. And while the need for surgical contingency plans was, uh, was outlined in both the 2014 Institute of Medicine Review and the 2015 NASA Space Technology Roadmap, 
these needs still haven't been fully satisfied. So let's talk a little bit more about surgical risk. Um, there's an estimated 27% chance of at least one surgical event arising on a six-member crew over the course of a three-year Mars mission. And that's based on using this integrated medical model and analyzing it with some data um, and some inputs that are specific to the spaceflight setting. Uh, so by surgical event, we mean a medical event for which the terrestrial standard of care would normally be surgery. And real-time communication with terrestrial resources, as I mentioned, and that includes things like robotic telesurgery will not be an option because time delays uh, at times will actually exceed um, about 20 minutes. And uh, to put it in perspective, in terrestrial telesurgery studies, a time delay or latency of as little as 150 milliseconds is considered to be disruptive. So even the second and a half uh, or two seconds or so of latency that are expected between the Earth and the Moon would likely prohibit reliable telesurgical capabilities. So we really can't plan on that. We can't anticipate that. Um, and so I want to make it clear that you know, what, what we're not proposing, and George mentioned this as well, what we're not proposing is a pop-up operating room at this stage. Um, and I think most folks would agree that logistically, you know, and given not only the medical concerns or considerations, but also the mass power and volume constraints and the overall potential benefit really doesn't support such an approach, especially not in the near term. Um, but what we're, ex what we're instead investigating and suggesting is a more creative and innovative program that allows for this kind of concept of interventional medicine, where procedural intervention is really on more of a spectrum as opposed to what we classically think of as surgery. Um, so that's going to take a little bit more creativity, but, uh, but that's why we're here. Um, and recognize that the most common surgical illnesses in an otherwise healthy patient population are acute appendicitis and acute cholecystitis. And there's ongoing debate about the risk benefit profile of prophylactic appendectomies. Um, but even if we were to adopt such a policy like our QE colleagues, we still need to be able to treat surgical problems as they arise um, autonomously and with limited materials. All right, so which medical procedures are we even talking about? Using the IMM 100 conditions as a guide, um, a few of us got together and identified a series of procedures that may reasonably need to be performed during a space mission. Uh, and exploration class space mission specifically. Uh, and all of the procedures listed here can be performed under local anesthesia, regional block, uh, and or potentially sedation. So um, let's see. And then um, in addition to the basic procedures on that on the last slide, we identified some additional procedures that would very likely be feasible, but might require some additional technology like an advanced scope or support in the form of additional image guidance. And I know George talked about um, ultrasound guided um, drainage of an abscess, for example, which, you know, as far as I think a lot of us are concerned on the surgical front, um, is a very reasonable way of managing, uh, a, you know, perforated appendicitis, for example. Um, and if needed, the Robinaut II um, uh, that George mentioned um, is also capable of potentially controlling ultrasound or controlling an ultrasound probe to free up an operator's hands for an interventional procedure. So that's something that we can potentially take advantage of in the future. Um, and you know, this is really an exciting time to be involved in surgery um, in that surgical technology is rapidly advancing and a bunch of the items, uh, or a bunch of items are listed here, but I wanna highlight 3D printing of surgical tools that George touched on as well. Um, this is a hot topic and the subject of a lot of ongoing development. And while some surgical tools are still too complex, to be printed using our current technology, these capabilities are really rapidly advancing. Um, you know, there is actually a tissue printer, uh, or was recently a tissue printer on board the ISS. And so, you know, this might actually be useful down the line for skin grafting in the event of a burn or things like that. So things are changing, things are evolving. Um, this is a pretty cool time to be involved in this stuff. So back to the appendicitis case um, scenario that George talked us through. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate that true surgical capabilities um, in my mind, will be developed at some point for the space flight setting, but it's it's definitely still a work in progress. And until we get more people flying regularly, the resources that are involved in facilitating classical surgical care in space are a very hard sell on the engineering side. Um, and so my bet is that in the near term, we'll be taking more of a temporizing approach to the management of surgical disease and probably save more definitive care for when crews are back on Earth. Um, you know, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that, I think. 
Um, in terms of prophylactic surgery, uh, several years ago, a few of us actually got together and uh, used the integrated medical model to evaluate the um, the risk, you know, essentially the risk benefit profile of doing prophylactic appendectomies and or cholecystectomies. And what we realized was that the risks associated with performing uh, these prophylactic, you know, surgical procedures uh, were essentially equivalent to the benefit, um, such that it was effectively a wash when you when you look at the numbers. And so then when you take a step back and consider some of the ethical implications of mandating uh, a procedure that by all accounts terrestrially would be considered unnecessary, um, you know, it ended up not being the recommendation. So, yeah. And I did want to reiterate that these these discussions, this this whole topic is it's really not just about space. All of the advancements that we discuss in this kind of setting are intended to be useful on Earth as well, and to enhance uh, patient care in this setting too. And of course, we don't get anywhere alone. Um, and George mentioned this too. I've been very fortunate to have some really wonderful mentors and colleagues along the way who keep pushing and encouraging and facilitating this sort of collaborative work. It's very much a team sport. Um, and one of the people on this slide may look especially familiar, top left. All right, so with that, these are my references. And I did want to mention, uh, if any folks in the audience are, uh, you know, enjoy thinking about tech and device innovation and uh, surgery in the space flight setting, you might be interested to hear uh, a little bit more about the Space Surgery Association. Feel free to check out the website. Um, you can, you're welcome to email us and I'll go to the next slide here. Uh, we've been an organization, uh, oh, actually, um, yeah, we've been an organization since uh, 2019. And you can email space surgery at gmail.com for a little bit uh, more information there too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. So I, I see that Chris is Chris is raring to go here. It looks like he's ready to jump out of the screen and make some some comments. So I don't want to hold him off too long, but let me just make one observation and, and Treat it as a question, uh, Danny, so you can respond to this as, as you want. But I think you mentioned a couple of, of interesting things that I'll combine. Commercial space flight. Commercial space flight could certainly change the equation here. Uh, imagine a case of mining on the moon where people are living there for an extended period of time, doing some serious work, manual labor, heavily automated, presumably, but manual labor, really moving stuff around. Traumatic injury would be very likely, among other things, just being there for a longer period of time. And again, the idea uh, that if you have something that even might be, uh, you might be able to stabilize long enough to get somebody back to earth, would you really want them to undergo the stresses of a launch from the moon and a return to earth, the G loading in particular. Uh, so, uh, so I think commercial space flight will change the calculation, but also I think in some maybe unanticipated ways, one of them being that it's not clear that people who would sign up to go to, to the moon or even later to Mars who are not professional astronauts it's not clear what sort of risk benefit calculation they would be buying into. Whereas professional astronauts, they know by profession how to weigh and calculate risks and the risks that they would be willing to take for the sake of the mission. That may not be the case for, for non-professional astronauts. And so it, it ties into the other comment you made about about terrestrial standard of care. Mm -hmm. It's not at all clear that we'll be able to meet the terrestrial standard of care when you start putting people on the moon later to Mars for longer durations, asking them to do more and more work. It's not exactly a question, but I'll ask if you have any comment on that. Sure. I mean, I think big picture, I, I'm tracking, you know, I, I'm with you there. I think the, the whole landscape of, um, of medical care and space is going to evolve a lot in the next several years, um, you know, not only as a result of some of the advancements and new technologies and things that have come online and that are already being explored at NASA and other uh, government-driven entities, but also as a function of the commercial space flight sector. 
Um, it's, it's a pretty cool thing if you think about it. You know, the fact that there are just there are more uh, intelligent minds thinking about this problem, and it's pertinent, it's relevant to more and more people. Um, so I think, you know, big picture, we as a larger community stand to gain tremendously from increased involvement. That's actually one of the things that we've tried to focus on with the Space Surgery Association. It's um, encouraging inclusivity. It's a lot of the folks that are involved in that group aren't surgeons or aren't anesthesiologists or have no experience whatsoever in that realm, but bring a different skill set that needs to be considered too. So, um, but all that being said, I agree with you. Okay, good. That's a great place to end your comment. Thank you. Okay, so now we will turn it over to uh, Chris Lanehart for comments from somebody who's actually paid to perform some of these these trade-offs. And uh, Chris's element within NASA is the home of the integrated medical model and its successor, MedPratt. So Chris, tell us your perspective on what you've heard. Uh Absolutely. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. And, and thank you to both George and Danny for your presentations. They were great. And I, I very much appreciated and enjoyed them. I, I will say that the one of the things coming back to, uh, to George's presentation and, and Mark, the question that you asked him at the end of his presentation had a lot to do with the, the operational medicine paradigm. Um, and so Danny also mentioned the the difference between a, a preventative medicine or occupational medicine approach versus the traditional medical approach to medical problems. But in operational medicine, in a military context, for example, when we talk about operational medicine, in many cases, they mean that the mission comes first um, and that the, the people may end up having injuries or even potentially dying in order to accomplish the mission. Um, and that is one thing that from a, a NASA perspective or a military perspective, when we think about how we look at the calculations of what we do on a given mission, some of that is related to the balance between the need to maintain the health and performance and safety of the astronauts and the importance of accomplishing the mission. Um, and so the, for the first mission to Mars, as an example, there's going to be a lot of pressure from a lot of different people to successfully complete that mission. Um, and so those operational constraints or pressures are going to be another consideration that we have to think about when we're looking at how we best maintain and optimize the health and performance of the astronauts. So there's the occupational and preventative medicine side of things. There's the medical, acute medical treatment side of things. And then of course, there's the, the discussion about what are the operational or mission constraints that uh, that may be driving some decisions that go forward. The, the focus on the word surgery, and, and, and I'll even rephrase that to say the lack of focus on the word surgery, I think is terribly important here because the when we go to the average engineer or person at NASA who's designing systems and we say, we need surgery in space, in their brain, they cannot help it. They see an operating room. And the moment that they see an operating room and all the stuff that comes with it, they balk at the idea of this capability because they cannot conceive of a way in which we would be able to fly all of that mass and volume. And so I think that the important thing for us as the, as the medical community as a whole and as people who are passionate and interested in how we advance medical capability in spaceflight is for us to very clearly define what we're talking about. And what we're talking about is progressively more complicated invasive procedures. Uh, and so I really appreciated seeing in both of the presentations, the focus on that capability as a stepping stone towards a more complete or more full, full surgical capability. The, the discussions that we have on a regular basis at NASA are to the point where someone says, are you sure you need that one kilogram of mass for something? Um, so the moment we start talking about hundreds of kilograms of mass for surgical capabilities, their eyes glaze over. Um, and so by being able to talk about, for example, the, the robotic assistance 
And it certainly may be a humanoid type robot, or it may be some other form of robotic assistance that would be uh, available. I think that every time we talk about this as a capability, we have to talk about the innovation that comes along with developing this capability so that we can help to convince the engineers and the people who design the systems and build the systems that what we are asking for is both reasonable and achievable. And so to that end, <clears throat> there's a story that I love, which is that on Apollo 11, they decided to reduce the number of band-aids in the medical kit from 12 to six because they were trying to save mass. Um, and when you think about the mass of a band-aid, that seems kind of ridiculous, um, but we are having those discussions all the time. And the way that we try to approach that at NASA is to, from an engineering perspective, is to perform a trade space analysis. And so ultimately, in many cases, when we go to the medical community and we say, what do you want on this mission? They will give us a long list of things that they want for any given mission. And we then have to say to them, well, what if you can't have something? How do you determine the value of one capability against another capability? And in many cases, at least historically, the answer was subject matter expert opinion. The challenge with subject matter expert opinion is that it doesn't normally come with numbers. And engineers love numbers. Program managers and vehicle designers want to know the, the risk buy down that comes along with any given capability. And so the, the evolution of the integrated medical model that we're working on now at Exploration Medical Capability is called IMPACT. And our hope with IMPACT is that we will be able to perform trade space analysis between all capabilities and all resources that make up a medical system. And in doing so, what I believe we can do in the future is we can actually take different types of surgical or let's call them invasive procedures as capabilities. We can include those in the model itself and we can then determine how many conditions are treated as a result of including that capability and what the quantitative risk reduction is as a result of including that capability. And I believe that when we can make those comparisons, I think that we can take the information that we need to the engineering community and to the vehicle design community and explain to them the rationale for increasing the capability in order to reduce the risk. And the ability to do that as a trade space analysis is a key capability that NASA has never had in the past from a medical system design perspective. And it's one that we hope that impact will enable us to do. And our objective is to have impact fully completed and ready to go its first version uh, in the spring of this coming year, and then have it fully transitioned to operations and be in use by NASA uh, by the end of the summer of next year. So my hope, my, my intent, my goal is that XMC will be able to more fully address the question of what the value is of invasive procedure capabilities and how we can then use that information to make the case for including those types of capabilities in our future mission design. Chris, thank you very much. Great comments. I, I love the point that, that you made the word surgery, loaded word like some, so many things that non-specialists can, can toss around and it carries a lot of baggage with it. In this case, literal baggage, but the idea that surgery is on a continuum, and I think this was, this was implicit, if not explicit in, in all the conversations today. What you mean is, I, I really love the phrase, progressively more complex invasive procedures leading up possibly to what we under, what we uh, non-experts think of as actual surgery. And I could certainly see the envelope of that expanding as more and more things become possible to do with minimal, minimally invasive surgery or guided surgery of various kinds. So let me throw that comment back to uh, George and Danny and see if they wanna 
pick up on that anything anything other than just saying that you agree with that um does that trigger any thoughts sure i can go first so actually this is something that chris and i have talked about before um you know including at the most recent uh conference back in may um and i, I think so i think he and i are fundamentally on the same page about this uh, this topic um and I know it's it's been discussed also in these in fora like this previously that that yes you know surgery does conjure up a, a picture of this pop up operating room which is a lot more robust than what we're really talking about when we're saying hey this is an austere environment there there are very limited resources think about if you were out in the middle of nowhere on earth you know in the middle of a field that's miles and miles and miles away from anything and all you can carry is what you can fit in a backpack. You know that that that's kind of the similar that's the the thought process that uh, that goes on with this type of uh, of planning of mission planning, at least fundamentally. Um, so you know, I, I hate to say it, I do agree, <laughs> but um, but again, Chris and I have chatted about this before. So and so have George and I, but yeah. yeah I'm also intrigued. Oh, sorry, before we go to to George. That, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to think of these things in terms of the interactions of the various parts, which this this became very clear to me when I spent some time at NASA about, as Chris was saying, you can't, you can't change, you just can't turn one knob without implicating 10 other knobs. Sometimes those knobs are owned by different people, different divisions, different groups within NASA or the flight provider or whatever. So, I'm intrigued now by an idea that it just occurred to me. Maybe uh, in the long run, the mission planners would explicitly try to keep mission activities, that is the activities of the crew, within a certain envelope that would be more likely to result in injuries if they did occur, that would be treatable by the current medical procedures. The current available medical procedures. So you would deliberately avoid putting people into a position where they would get some type of traumatic injury that might require surgery, a form of surgery, a form of interventional medicine that just isn't isn't available. And then that raises a very intriguing possibility because those groups generally, in my experience, don't engage in back and forth interactive conversations. It's typically a set of requirements that are put into place, and then the medical people are asked to meet those requirements to maintain crew health and performance. This could be a, a, a place where they actually feed back to the mission and spacecraft planners and say, you're putting the crew into a position where this particular type of injury now is at 5% likelihood, not 0.5% likelihood, and we just can't treat that. So redesign your mission. I'd like to see how that conversation plays out. Hmm. I was waiting for Chris to comment on that since he's the one who would have to engage in that conversation. Yes, I, I can I can tell you how that that conversation has historically played out, yeah. <laughs> which is where the um, in general, the if the if the medical teams and the and the systems engineering design teams cannot adequately make their case, um, they often get overruled. And so it's a uh, part of the challenge, I think that you are proposing there, Mark, is that in order to have those conversations, we have to be able to quanti quantify the risk of the mission itself and the tasks that are going to be part of that mission and use that quantification to justify the request for additional resources that will enable the capabilities to treat those high risk conditions or outcomes. And so I think that that is <clears throat> exactly the type of conversation that engineering communities typically have amongst each other. And I think in general, the human systems community and the medical community have not always been part of those discussions in the past. And it's very much our hope to change that going forward by being able to use a tool like impact to be able to speak engineering better so that they will understand the, the concerns that the medical and the human system side has with respect to not only vehicle design, but also, as you said, mission design. 
Yeah, they, actually, there's a strange analogy that just occurred to me, an analogy to our previous mini symposium topic, which was uh, back in March, I believe, on statistics at the challenge of small end statistics for human spaceflight research. And the idea that you cannot, you, uh, you can, but you should not wait until you've designed and performed your study and then turn it over to the statistician and say, fix it, make it, tell me what statistical test do I need to do? Just like this, you should not design your spacecraft and your mission and select the crew and then turn it over to the people like you, Chris, and say, here's what you got. Here's the hand you're dealt. Make sure they come back healthy and, and that they are safe on the mission. It should be a two-way conversation that starts much earlier. And so, yeah, the idea of having to break down boundaries to do this, I think, is, is should be part of the conversation. And um, that doesn't happen as, much, as often as it should. George, I wanted to turn it over to you and see if you had comments on this on this topic. You know you're muted, right? Thank you. There you go. Um, I, it, ironically, this is a, an argument for having more physicians who are also engineers so that they can understand the challenges and the perspectives and the, if you will, the restrictions that their discipline puts on thinking. So that, and, and as well as the language, uh, you know, engineers and physicians can use the same word and it means something completely different to them. So um, having more people with interdisciplinary training, getting involved in the process and at, at the very beginning, uh, I think would go a long way to help eat demanding mission requirements, but in a realistic way um, and coming up with, with the ways uh, early on of helping us meet those mission requirements. And, and that it, it goes even beyond healthcare. It, it, uh, I've heard discussions recently about looking at the design of at least the, the compartments of a spaceship where the human crew members are involved. What can we do to, to the design of those compartments to make them enhance crew performance and crew mental health and, and crew well-being. Uh, th there's so many different aspects of this that uh, could be considered. Now, the comment I was gonna make earlier was um, in uh, many of the requests to, to look at surgical capabilities, in, including the grant that I had from Trish a few years ago, they all mentioned minimally invasive surgical techniques. And whimsically, I will say the only thing minimally invasive about minimal invasive surgical techniques is what goes inside the body. It's what supports the minimally invasive technique that puts the real challenge as far as mass, power, volume, and, and other constraints as well. So one of the discussions that uh, should needs, also needs to be had is what is the uh, most efficient a surgical approach given the, res the limitations of spaceflight. Uh, yeah, you can do a lot of things minimally invasively and generally it's, it's uh, in the best interest of, of more rapid recovery for the patient. But maybe there are some things that you need to look at uh, doing open rather than minimally invasive. And this is, this is a point of great contention in some discussions that you have. But um, just because it's the latest and greatest in what's the standard of care in earth-based uh, surgery, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be the most appropriate for space-based and uh, constrained environment types of, of surgery as well. So that, that needs to be in the consideration um, of, of many of, of the circumstances that have been brought up so far today. Yeah. yeah and, the, and like anesthesia in spaceflight may be very different than anesthesia in a ground-based hospital. Lots of other things related to this. Yeah, I, I like the general, the, the couple general themes that you've just, just highlighted, but have been prevalent throughout this. One is the, the need to break down these 
organizational barriers, boundaries between the different groups, the engineering community, the mission ops community, <clears throat> the medical community, the medical design community. Um, but the other one is the, uh, the idea of that all of these things are on a continuum, on a spectrum. Right? So we could talk about surgery, but there's all sorts of different connotations, all sorts of different sets of implementations, and all sorts of different ways that you might implement it. And that makes much more explicit the idea that you could say, we're going to accommodate some sort of minimal invasive surgery, some sort of minimally complex invasive medical procedure in early flights. And if it turns out that they're needed and they're successful, that opens the door to more ambitious capabilities later on as the missions become more capable. It doesn't have to be a decision that is all made right up, uh, right up front. Mm -hmm. uh, Danny, you unmuted, I think. Did you have another comment? I did, I did. Um, so uh, I, first, I'm absolutely in full agreement with respect to the continuum thing. And in fact, that's how I um, often articulate it to people that these procedure, instead of thinking about it as classically as we are you know trained as surgeons classically that like you know you intervene surgically on something you take them to the operating room you do x y or z there is a pre-brief you you know anesthesia is induced and it's it's all of these things that require loads of resources um yes absolutely there is a continuum going all the way from inserting an iv which in the space flight setting is a lot more difficult than it sounds <laughs> and chris knows this intimately <laughs> i am sure um, from some of the challenges that folks have had there. Um, and then, you know, all the way up to open heart surgery and everything in between. It's absolutely a continuum. Um, to George's point, with respect to um, what minimally invasive surgery means and how that really, uh, that actually is dependent upon the context uh, or the environment within which that question is being, or that topic is being discussed. I also fully agree with that. If you look at some of the global health, global surgery related contexts, I've had the privilege of being involved in a bunch of that stuff in a number of, of uh, low resource settings. And the vast majority of procedures are performed open, of surgical procedures are performed open. And that's largely a, a function of the resources that are involved, you know, that go into it. You know, you, you don't need the concept of having a Da Vinci robot <laughs> engaged in doing something as simple you know, what we think of as, as simple as doing an appendectomy um, is ludicrous to most folks that are thinking from, you know, through the lens or looking through the lens of resource limitations. Um, and I did want to highlight one other thing, actually. Um, the concept of multifunction tools, I think, is um, is underemphasized in conversations such as this and certainly in the tech and innovation space. Um, the the engineer in me now can can truly vouch that to be able to really maximize um, use of mass power and volume from an engineering perspective and to be able to say, hey, how do we really optimize things medically and surgically? We need to be thinking a little bit more critically and a little more creatively. And so what that looks like to me is um, some of the research teams that I'm leading are developing different tools and techniques and procedures and things to be able to do exactly what I just described and to say, hey, how could we use this device in a bunch of different ways? Or how could we tweak this device so that actually it has multiple uses or multiple functions? Um, and it, it may sound like a really simple and you know ridiculous concept, but it's actually really important for this setting. And that's, I think, how we can, um, we can do more with less, which is really fundamentally what we're talking about, right? So. Yeah, that's a great point. And actually <clears throat> it leads me to a, to a final question, because I want to, I'm going to start bringing bringing this discussion to a close, so that we can then turn it over to Malika, who will moderate the uh, Q and A session. So that'll well, that'll come up in a couple of minutes. But first, I wanted to kind of follow up on Danny what you were talking about, but toss it over to George because what I haven't heard yet in this discussion is something about the actual experiments that have been going on, the things that the demos and experiments that especially I know George has been uh, involved with. Do you want to tell us a little bit something about that? I'm not asking for your full presentation, which is fascinating, <laughs> but I know <laughs> is, yep. is also lengthy. But mm -hmm. could you tell us just a couple of the, th the top issues that are involved 
things that you might not think about unless you've been in zero G yourself, like mm -hmm. controlling fluids in mm -hmm. a surgical setting in a zero G environment. What are some of the key issues and what have your experiments in parabolic flight and now suborbital flight mm -hmm. demonstrated? Uh, things that people might not be aware of that speak to the feasibility of doing surgery, whatever that means in space. Let me preface my comments by saying that many people going back uh, 30 years have been starting to address the very point that you brought out. Um, names like uh, Mark Campbell and uh, John Rock, um, a few other people like that have did a lot of work early on in parabolic flight planes simply to see if they could use some surgical tools and what were the problems that were going to come up in that. And uh, controlling bleeding was certainly one of them because if, if you have bleeding in an operating room in the earth or you have an injury, the blood is going to ooze out or it's going to squirt out if it's an arterial bleed, but then gravity wins and it eventually comes back down and you mop it up on your surgical field. If you're doing that in, in zero G, it's, well, venous blood, which is low pressure blood that kind of oozes out. Surface tension all of a sudden is going to become a much more dominant force. And so you're going to get this growing ball of venous blood that's going to ball up and float right in front of you that you're going to have to figure out how to suction it so that you don't disrupt it and so you can clear it from the surgical field. On the other hand, arterial blood is going to squirt and it's going to go fly away until it hits the surface. So containing the fluids um, in a surgical field is going to be important. One of the, the approaches, and there are many, that, that we've spent time looking at. It's ad adopting a surgical containment dome that a, a colleague of mine who's a neurosurgeon uh, proposed many, many years ago. And, and the idea is you have a transparent dome that has uh, skin-friendly adhesive around the perimeter that you stick over the body where either the site of surgery is gonna take place or where the site of trauma is gonna take place. And then it, it has, leak free ports where you can introduce your different surgical instruments to do a revision uh, or cautery uh, to seal off uh, small bleeding vessels, put your suction uh, wand in there to, to clear away the debris and the blood, uh, any number of things. And we've uh, developed um, this model to the point where we've flown it several times on the zero G aircraft, in fact, Danny's been, been a part of some of those flights in recent times, to, to demonstrate that you can contain the surgical field and you can contain bleeding and, and that you can suction your fluids away, you can collect them. Uh, we've demonstrated that you can treat it, treat the fluids so that you can re remove the debris that collects in it, and then you can put it through an, another type of filter that removes most of the, the high protein content to it gets to the point where it could become fluid that you can introduce into the water recovery system, like the, the one that's on the space station right now. And the out, output of it is drinkable water, potable water. And then you can put it into the IV gen technology that the biotech group up at NASA Glenn has developed, and that can create sterile water or sterile saline to, to go back uh, into healthcare of uh, future situations with crews so that you don't have to have a great deal of this stuff manifested at, at the time of launch. So that's one of the things we look at. One of the other things we looked at is minimizing the amount of instrument exchanges that are needed because they take up time, they might distract surgeon focus on what's going on. And so um, we've created a uh, what looks like a surgical suction wand that actually incorporates five functions with fingertip control on the handle. And it, it will provide suction, irrigation, illumination, vision, and uh, cautery as well. So the surgeon, all they have to do is use one tool and push a different button on the handle to get the five different functions. So that's, those are some of the things that we've 
been working on, when I say we, lots and lots of students at various levels, other faculty colleagues. And then we've been, when we have the, the opportunity to, we then test them out in reduced gravity, primarily on parabolic flights, but also uh, on suborbital flights. So what actually was performed, my last question for this mm -hmm. part of the program, what, what, uh, what specifically did, was performed on the Virgin Galactic suborbital flight? What we did was we tested out an automated version of our surgical fluid management system. And to, there were 32 functional steps in the less than three minute period of microgravity. But we, um, we had one of these surgical domes. It was attached to a simulated piece of skin. When our controller detected that we'd entered the period of microgravity, the first thing that happened was uh, the controller made our infusion pumps automatically fill our surgical containment dome with irrigation solution without trapping air bubbles. And that's, that's an interesting bit of fluid physics uh, management in and of itself. And then once the dome was filled, the fact that it was filled was automatically detected and it turned off the uh, infusion pump and it uh, shut the valve uh, on the exhaust port at the top of the dome. Uh, then the next thing we did was we performed a therapeutic tamponade, we mean, meaning we progressively uh, put in increments of fluid into the dome to progressively raise the pressure to slow or stop bleeding, because that's a technique that could be used. And then we brought the pressure back down. And then after we did that, we actually injected a small bolus of analog blood that mimicked the viscosity and the density and the appearance of real blood so that with our, our multifunction surgical device that I just described, we could demonstrate for suction of the blood and then we could demonstrate irrigation and then as, as well as illumination of the surgical field. And then the next thing we did was we knew from our parabolic flights, um, if you purged three volumes of the dome, it would essentially clear the debris and, and the visual obstruction. So you now had a clear view of what was going on again inside the dome for the surgeon to continue. And then the last step we did was we emptied the dome of the surgical uh, um, irrigation solution. Uh, all, all that in less than three minutes uh, in microgravity. And that was all automated. Is that, is that it correct? It was to totally automated. Yeah, that was yeah, not, it, not it, a human tended experiment. No, it was not. And, and in fact, what kicked off the automation was when the accelerometers that were on a controller were in agreement that it, it was in a, a sustained environment that was less than 0 0.05 Gs. Then it triggered all the different steps in the protocol that I just described to you. So uh, the only thing that happened was pre-flight after it got spacecraft power, um, the controller booted up and it was continuously interrogating the accelerometers and we had a special algorithm so that it didn't accidentally trigger the protocol during the reduced gravity period when spaceship two is free falling from the carrier ship right. before the rocket motor lit up because the last thing you want to do is turn on your experiment and then all of a sudden hit a, a minute of very intense hypergravity. Yeah, yeah, good, uh, good thinking. So it opens up a whole new set of possibilities and very likely we will have one of our mini symposium topics in the future. The near future will be on commercial space flight, opening up possibilities just like the one that you described, George, for new experiments and, and soon, hopefully, actual human tended and human subject research on sub, uh, commercial suborbital flights. Okay. Yeah. Thank you to the three speakers. I'm going to now turn it over to Malika Sarma, who is a postdoc working with me, helps me run the bioastronautics program here at Hopkins. And she is going to moderate the question and answer session. So Dr. Sarma. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, this has been a great set of talks. We have some really exciting um, and uh, hard hitting uh, questions from here in the audience. 
So I'm going to start, um, actually first, I wanna thank Nabila Ali, who is a medical student and a public health student who is helping me manage these questions. There are many of them, so I appreciate it. Uh, but to start, when we're talking about making these difficult, critical decision-making um, problems coming towards them, what would happen if the sick member, so someone who requires medical care, is the medical officer? This question comes from Gary A. And related to that, what would be the minimal amount of training needed for maybe other crew members to take over this medical capability? You want to start on that, Chris, or do you want me to? <laughs> <laughs> OK, cool. Um, so I think, uh, and I'm, I'm sure Chris and George will both chime in on this, but um, in response to the first part of that question, there's, a, there's always a backup crew medical officer. Um, on each of these missions. And so it's not just one person who's medically trained who flies, it's two. Um, and so even if now, you know, now with missions back and forth to the ISS, there's not always a physician on board the ISS, but there is somebody who's trained medically to be able to respond to emergencies. And then there's a backup person who also receives some amount of training, although that's less. Um, now, shifting to the second question, how much training exactly would be necessary or would be recommended? Um, and what should that look like when we're considering surgical disease as well as medical disease? That's something that actually George and I have uh, given presentations on before and have published on before um, in terms of proposing um, a training protocol that takes all of these different considerations into account. Um, and I think, the, the exact number of hours of training that would be required or that would be recommended is going to vary based on that individual, like the primary crew medical officer and also the backup CMO. It's going to depend on their own background and the amount of prior training and prior experience that they have. But realistically speaking, there should be a significant chunk of hours that sh that's incorporated into the, the overall CMO kind of training timeline um, prior to a mission. So I, I'm sure Chris can, and George, again, can speak to uh, some of these nuances and some of the, the restrictions and limitations on, uh, on crew time leading up to missions, but um, that's my two cents right now. Actually. The, oh, sorry, George, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Malika. Um, that poses the same tension that came up earlier about what do we get to take on the mission and there being a difference of opinion depending on where you stand in, in the discussion. Um, Danny and I have, have talked many times about this is the amount of training and this is the, the content of the training and all that stuff. But then you have the problem of other people who manage the training schedule leading up to the launch as tightly as the actual performance schedule of each crew member once the mission has started and the jockeying for those minutes and what's what's going to be needed. So um, that's that's going to be a never a never ending negotiation, I think. Um, one of the things that might be helpful is that not only is there going to be the need for the pre-flight training, but there's going to need be the need for refresher training as the mission goes on, um, and time will tell how that plays out as we're spending more and more time on the surface of the moon, and as you're filling in the eight months transit time that's expected when you get to Mars, uh, one might argue, well, with more time, um, maybe there'll be more uh, opportunities for refresher training, and that might take place in several different ways. Um, you might have aug augmented reality training. You may have three-dimensional holographic training that can be periodically looked at. And of course, this training can be updated as the mission progresses. I mean, just you know, transmit the new latest version of the training module to where those are kept in on board the spacecraft so that the next time the crew member goes to it, they can get the latest and greatest thoughts uh, on what the training will be. So it's a dynamic process throughout the duration of the mission. Yeah, I love that idea because it incorporates the concept of unique, meaningful work, mm -hmm. which is yeah. a potential issue for yeah. uh, something as long with high performing individuals who are not used to just sitting around, basically mm -hmm. sitting around for nine months, mm -hmm. keep them busy. 
And it's not like you can take your knitting up. Mass volume problem. Right. <laughs> yeah. Chris, would you like to respond? Sure, happy to. I think that if we if we apply the Murphy's Law adage here, um, the best thing for us to do is to assume at any given point, if there's a medical emergency, that the person that is having that emergency is the primary medical person on board. Yep. Um, and we can use that position to then help us to determine the, the best way to manage that potential situation. And I will stress that, that I agree with Danny completely on, on any given mission, they always have more than one crew medical officer on board. Um, but sometimes you'll hear people saying that the crew medical officers on board are trained at the level of an, of an EMT or a paramedic. And, and I, I, I always worry a little bit about that statement because frankly, it, it's at times insulting to EMTs and paramedics because we send people to space sometimes who are crew medical officers and they spend 40 hours training. Mm -hmm. um, and an EMT, for example, will go and take a, a graduate course or an un undergraduate course at a university and it'll last for six months or longer in order to become an EMT. So the, the training that we give to astronauts now on space station is very much aligned with the paradigm that we use in spaceflight right now on the space station, which is if something bad happens, you are coming home, um, stabilize and leave. And so in the, in the emergency medical services world, this is, this is described as the scoop and run versus the stay and play. <laughs> and what we do right now in space station is aligned very much to scoop and run. Uh, but what we are going to need for exploration missions is going to have to be aligned to stay and play. So the, I completely agree. The amount of training we're going to need for exploration missions is absolutely going to increase. But just as we have to make quantitative decisions about why we need more mass and volume for a medical system, we're going to have to take the same discussions to the training folks at NASA and explain to them why we're going to take time away from training an astronaut on another system for them to get additional medical training. Because every astronaut, even if they're a crew medical officer, is an astronaut first and has to be able to do every task that every other astronaut can do on board. Um, so in some ways, it's actually somewhat similar to the military paradigm, where I'm a medical officer in the military, but I have to be able to perform all the tasks that a soldier performs in addition to my medical tasks. And so the, the reality is, is that the training schedule is finite and we are gonna have to make trades on the training schedule in order to accommodate additional medical training. But I did want to expand on something that George said and take it one step further. I think in mission, I hope in mission, not only are we gonna train people before they go and retrain people or refresh people in flight, I think people in flight are going to want to learn new capabilities, mm -hmm. new procedures, yeah. new uh, ideas. Um, and in essence, what we often refer to this as is just in time training, but there might even be a more robust training schedule on a mission to Mars, for example, where the people on board are all learning new skills and knowledge that they didn't have when they left Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and we're using some of the time in mission to accomplish their training, understanding that there's a risk that if they're gonna train for something six months into their Mars mission and it happens three months in, that we're in a pickle. Mm -hmm. um, but that might just be a reality that we have to accept. But we have tested just-in-time training on the space station um, using ultrasound and taking astronauts who are ultrasound naive in terms of operations um, and putting the probe in their hands, giving them a software tool that guides them through how to do a kidney and bladder ultrasound, for example, and turned off the communications and said, you're on your own, use the software, figure out how to do these ultrasounds. And they are smart, capable, driven people. They very quickly figure out how to do it. Um, and achieve medical grade images in relatively short time. So I think that the just-in-time training opportunities on an exploration mission are going to be essential because 
we're never going to get all the training time that we want on the ground. Thanks, Chris. So yeah. thinking, oh, go ahead, George. Yeah, so I, I wanted to add one thing to Chris's comment that, that takes off from Mark's comment about having useful, productive, creative time for crew members is that the training, although they might get the new module from mission control, it's actually going to need to be a two-way street where the crew members get the chance to uh, modify the new training that they've been presented with because they're living in the experience. And so they'll be able to provide additional insight that will be valuable to what they do, what their crew members do. And so mission control can have a better understanding of the circumstances that they're living to, to op tweak and optimize that training even more as the flight progresses. Now, these are really creative people and, and they like to try to use their knowledge and skill and, and what they've uh, experienced even as the mission goes on to, to make things even better. Definitely. And I think to Mark's earlier point, there are definitely cognitive benefits for continuing this work. So wins all around. Mm -hmm. So thinking further about trade-offs, uh, Riley Ferguson has a question about future, <laughs> future spacecrafts and thinking about adaptations that need to be made to the engineering of the spacecraft. Would it make more sense to think of uh, multi-use multi equipment within current spacecrafts like the dining table or a suite? Or should there be more focus on the development of for say a health module in a ship. And I'll let anyone take that. Well, if I can start out with a historical perspective and first of all, uh, greetings to you, Riley. I know Danny and I know Riley already. Maybe she's met Chris as well or Mark. Um, if you look back at what was called Space Station Freedom which eventually became the International Space Station there was one whole module called the health maintenance facility that was there both for crew member care as well as to support medical research. And, and by the time the International Space Station flew, it was down to, I think, one or two racks. Now, as medical circumstances have developed throughout the life of this space station, the medical capabilities have grown. So um, the concept of a, of a module for health and and true health and uh, treatment is, is a known concept that probably should be revisited. But it, again, it's going to be a matter of, of the mass volume power trade-off that, that Chris and Danny have talked about that will prevail, especially in the early stages. When you get a lunar station where it's growing beyond a few modules that have been connected together to emerging into these wonderful artist conceptions of a small lunar colony. E eventually, one of those nodes in the colony is going to be a clinic so that it's, it's conveniently located and accessible. That's where I think the opportunity for advanced, uh, an advanced healthcare facility is, is going to become available. But th that that's all I have to say for now. Maybe Danny or Chris have some additional comments that they would like to add. Yeah, I, so hi, Riley. Um, and I think uh, I, I agree with George. I think as much as I, I hate to give kind of a wishy-washy answer here, it, the, the reality is that it's going to depend. Um, and, you know, the, the resources that we have available or the extent to which we're able to really build up the medical suite is, is just going to depend on what context we're talking about and just how large a given spacecraft or space habitat happens to be. Um, so that's the way that I think about it, at least. Chris? I would add that that I think that the, the foreseeable constraints on exploration missions, deep space exploration missions, are going to make it very hard for us to make a, a coherent case for a, a dedicated module unless we're in the situation that George is talking about where we're, we're starting to grow the population on the lunar surface and we're building up the infrastructure there as part of the habitation capability. But what I think makes, uh, what is particularly interesting in this area right now, and I know they actually did a, 
a team project on this recently that I was an advisor for at the International Space University is new commercial space stations in low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. um, these yeah. are potentially places where uh, the people who are flying to those new space stations are arguably going to have more money than health. Um, they are going to have uh, a higher risk of medical conditions occurring in their time in space. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, if they have paid many millions of dollars for that mission, they are not going to want to come home early if they don't have to. And so the ability to provide a higher level of care in the spaceflight environment in low Earth orbit may be part of the business model that commercial uh, low Earth orbit space stations are looking at in terms of their ability to fly the people who want to pay and fly to space and also keep them healthy and keep them in space as long as they want to be there by being able to provide additional expanded medical capabilities as part of their space station design. Raises the question of whether or not there would be a case <clears throat> in the future in which it would be preferable to do some type of surgery or medical procedure in a zero G environment. Well, so there, I do want to mention actually uh, to that point, and I had mentioned to bring this up previously, I actually had an opportunity to talk with um, Jay Bucky and Jim Pavelchik about some of their experiments that were done on Neurolab um, back in the early 2000s on rodents. And so they actually did perform a, effectively surgical procedures and needed to deal with thing, with the fluid dynamics issues that George was describing earlier. In fact, their workaround was to use a little ray tech or a little, you know, um, sponge pad as a wick, uh, mm -hmm. and then just take advantage of capillary action and avoid the whole blood bubbling up in one spot uh, issue that George mentioned. But, you know, so we have had uh, one really solid mission uh, example of that, you know, in mission example um, of surgical procedures. But I totally agree. It'd be, it'd be wonderful to be able to get more, more insight. So perhaps a technical question. There are uh, several questions on anesthesia in a space flight environment. So uh, Kimia Saeed Madani asks, one of the concerns for surgery in space is anesthetic equipment and dose response. Thoughts on that? Is AI assistance uh, helpful? And Daniel has a follow-up question, if there are any effects or risks of anesthesia in microgravity. It's actually a really complicated question. Um, and there are some folks that I would be able to point you to uh, that have more of a robust anesthesiology background to be able to address some of those, those questions more specifically. But big picture, yes, anesthesia is thought to, or we know that um, the human body responds to a variety of different medications differently in space. And one thing that we haven't really touched on much so far in this session is the reality that over time, you know, when exposed to the space flight setting, especially deep space with the radiation involved and everything, there's a very real possibility that some medications could degrade. So the, you know, or change, you know, be like fundamentally biochemically changed so that the, the effect on the human body, on human physiology of, you know, X dose of Y medication one month into a mission may be very different from, you know, the effect on the human body of that very same dose of that same medication 20 months into a mission. We really don't know yet. Um, and I think, or I know that there are a number of studies that are ongoing and there's a lot of work being done at JSC on how best to preserve um, like pharmacologic stability um, given the, the different um, stressors, you know, or, or different um, factors that are intrinsic to the space flight setting. But, um, but that, that's a circuitous way of saying, yes, that's a very complicated question. I can't personally answer it very robustly, but I felt compelled to chime in as somebody who spends a lot of time in the operating room. Any other thoughts on anesthesia? Well, related to what Danny was just saying, there's even work because of the unknown uh, sufficient lifetime of activity of drugs in space, there's even efforts being made into 3D printing drugs so that you could have a way of having relatively fresh drugs available in an extended space mission. 
Uh, but getting back to the discussion of anesthesia, um, there's, first of all, do you want to have general anesthesia or is local anesthesia or regional anesthesia going to be sufficient? Um, is uh, doing a lumbar puncture, is that really going to be an effective way of anesthesia? Because part of what makes that work is the density difference of the cerebrospinal fluid versus the drug that you, ha you have that advantage when you're in 1G, but you don't have that advantage when you're in 0G. And it could distribute the blood or the uh, drug, anesthetic drug, in ways that you would rather it not be. So again, just one more thing that tags onto Danny's question that this is a, it's a pretty complicated and involved consideration. To build on that, I would say that I would view using the word anesthesia in the same way that I would view using the word surgery. Um, and, and it is very much a spectrum. And I anticipate that providing local or regional anesthetic, um, using ultrasound guidance or, or looking at uh, tissue markers or other areas that you could use to, to deliver that. Uh, would be certainly a relatively easy step along the way towards uh, a more complex anesthesia procedure. I will say that there's uh, some of the, the work that's gone on in looking at how inha inhalational anesthetics would respond in the spaceflight environment and how you would deal with getting some of that into the cabin and the impact it would have on the other people in the cabin. I would say that at least in the near term, it's very hard to imagine a future uh, where we're using something that's inhalational. But if we're talking about procedural sedation with injections or drips, if we're talking about regional or local anesthesia, I think all of those are well within the realm of possibility. Mm -hmm. And then, frankly, when we come back to the principle of operational medicine, um, sometimes you do what has to be done, regardless of whether or not you have the appropriate tools to do it. Um, and so there are, uh, in the military, there are units that are mobile surgical resuscitation units or teams, and they go around with a backpack full of stuff. Um, and they have the ability to provide pain medication and regional and local anesthetic, and maybe even some procedural sedation, but that's about it. And they then have to be able to perform any given procedure that they need to on someone to save their life. So in the event of not having everything we would want to have, but an emergency that requires us to act, I think the principles of operational medicine would take hold again in the space environment. Thanks, Chris. So we have lots of more questions. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, I encourage anyone with, with questions to uh, keep attending these seminars and hopefully we'll get to them at some point. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Mark. Thank you, Malika. Thanks for everyone who submitted questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them. Uh, contact information for our speakers is not that hard to find. If you can't find it, you can contact us at uh, bioastronautics at Hopkins or Hopkins at home or me or Malika. And um, we can forward questions, presuming that uh, the speakers would be willing to entertain them offline. Before we do the my formal close out of the session, I'm going to go through and in reverse order of, of their presentations and see if, if our three speakers have any closing comments that they would like to make. So we'll start with uh, you, Dr. Lanehart. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks to the Hopkins at home folks for this opportunity and to the other speakers here. I think that my, my closing, my one closing statement that I would make is that Oftentimes when we look at medical capability in spaceflight, we are very much driven by what we've done previously. Um, and the reality is, is that back during the Apollo era, many of the medical capabilities that we developed in spaceflight ended up driving and fundamentally changing healthcare on the ground. Right now on earth, the healthcare technology development industry is massive compared to what NASA has. Um, and so NASA is gonna be very much looking to 
terrestrial medical technologies that could then be adapted and modified for space flight. And we are always interested in learning more about new technologies and new capabilities that have applications in the space environment. And there's certainly some areas of space medicine technology development work that XMC and NASA is, is looking into because they are unique to the spaceflight environment. But a lot of the really innovative, new, cool technologies that are being developed for Earth applications also have space applications. And so they, I would say that in the future, everything for Earth um, can be applied to space and, and hopefully everything in space can be applied to Earth and that, that cycle continues. Thanks, Chris. That's actually a great point. People, people seem to think that NASA has all the money in the world and in particular NASA human space flight and therefore human research, human research for space flight uh, has an abundance of excess cash and can support development of all of these technologies, procedures, and it just isn't the case. And if you consider the range of things that have to be considered for within the human research program and Trish and related organizations, uh, it's huge. It's massive. It's like a miniature NIH, but they have nowhere near the funds of NIH. I, last time I calculated, I think it's one two hundredth of the size of NIH. And uh, it's a niche, admittedly, but it's it's no longer the case that NASA can drive the can drive the agenda in medical care for the for the most part because it's so expensive and the resources NASA has are are relatively limited. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Danny, closing comments. Absolutely. So first, I just want to reiterate, just like Chris mentioned, thank you so very much for the opportunity to speak here. Um, thank you to the whole team. This has been a really awesome and interesting conversation, I know for myself, um, and I hope it's been um, educational and interesting for the folks watching too. Um, as far as my closing comments, I did wanna say, it, it's really refreshing to see that this conversation has gotten bigger and bigger as the years have gone by. I know when I started uh, looking into this more and there, you know, folks like George and the, the folks that George mentioned, uh, Dr. Mark Campbell and others um, have been doing this work for decades, literally. Um, I've not been involved for quite as long, but uh, but have been involved for a handful of years now. And um, you know, when I started talking about the importance of considering surgical problems for the spaceflight environment, I used to get a blank stare. Um, <laughs> you know, oftentimes, or it would be a really, you know, that's kind of off the wall. That's a little crazy. But as things have gone, have moved on, and who've moved forward, it's become, I think, clearer and clearer to a lot more people that really we need to think about these problems and figure out how to creatively um, and intelligently, you know, manage these disease processes that would, would typically be dealt with terrestrially through surgery. Um, so I did wanna thank you for that. And I, I think um, it's really ex an exciting time to be involved in this work. So mm -hmm. thanks. Excellent, thank you. George, anything to say in closing? Expose your curiosity to as many different perspectives that you can. Uh, I know for me, I, I kind of stumbled into interdisciplinary education experience just by chance when I was a student. But the more I was exposed to different topics, different people's ideas, um, the, the more it helped me get a, a better idea of what the big picture was. What were the key questions? Um, and then figure out what, what particular skills and experiences do I have that I can apply to that, but then interact with more people because then you can synergize. No, no one has the answer to all the problems, but when you get a collection of people that have the right set of skills that complement each other, you can tackle some pretty tough problems and come up with some very useful uh, answers and solutions to that problem. So, so be open to sharing, being open to being challenged to things that you don't normally get exposed to. It uh, definitely makes your life a heck of a lot more interesting. Um, and it, it can make your life, your professional life, a heck of a lot more uh, productive and, and take you places you never thought you would be, within without gravity, for that matter. 
So uh, with that, um, thanks again to Mark. Thanks again to Hopkins at Home and to the people that produced this very delightful two hours that we spent together um, so that we could explore the, the notion of providing surgical capabilities uh, in space if it's needed. And so we'll be ready when it is needed. Thanks again. Very Bye. good, George. Yeah, thank you. I agree completely. And <clears throat> you, you dangled this in front of me so, so strongly that I cannot resist to once again <laughs> promote a book that I talk about frequently in a number of different venues. And I do not get a commission or a kickback from promoting this book, although I should by now because I talk about it all the time. Yeah. But, there's a, but there is a book called Range by David Epstein. Uh, why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. Uh, freely available at your local bookstore and on Amazon and other places. Uh, but George, it speaks to the point that you were just making about not only building a team of various skills, but also being open to very, uh, acquiring various skills and knowledge in various areas because it's a juxtaposition mm -hmm. of ideas from two disparate domains that is often the breakthrough idea so you have to be narrow to some extent to establish credibility and to really understand something really well but you should always be open to learning something about the adjacent topics so when you're collaborating don't just give information learn something from the people you're collaborating with so on that point uh, i'll draw this discussion to a close and i have just enough time to obviously thank everyone who is involved. Clearly, everyone that you see on the screen, uh, thank you very much, the speakers, Malika, but also the people behind the scenes, the Hopkins at Home group especially, put this together, organize it, promote it, very professional group, always a pleasure to work with them. Uh, the people in the Office of Research Translation in the School of Medicine who help support these activities, Bioastronautics at Hopkins. Uh, the next symposium, topic to be determined and time to be determined, but we're looking at uh, probably early in the new year and stay tuned for advertisements coming out. If you have ideas for topics you would like to see considered, no promises, but get in touch with us and we'll see what we can do. So again, with that fantastic, thank you all of our speakers. Uh, the session is closed. Thanks for being here.